right. For the record, um, uh, Mark, you had words about uh, the status of the built-in module proposal as of our last TC39. And, yes. uh, and uh, a good opportunity to, to get um, Michael's uh, reflections on that as well. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, so at the last TC39 meeting, uh, built-in modules uh, in, the, in the form of that proposal uh, got blocked by uh, Google and Mozilla specifically. Um, so in that sense, uh, uh, that form of the proposal is no longer a live proposal. Uh, what several of us have discussed offline uh, is um, that the right way to proceed with the concerns addressed by that proposal uh, is to proceed with compartments first, um, since compartments allow JavaScript code to create a module and import environment for other, for other JavaScript code. Uh, and then uh, as once that's worked out and solid, then revisit the concerns behind built-in modules uh, in that context, built forward from there. That's all. Yeah, and with that uh, as context, uh, we've uh, invited Michael to join us. Uh, Michael was the champion for, uh, is the champion for built-in modules um, and uh, expressed an interest in, um, in what we're doing for compartments. And welcome, Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, one of three um, champions for, for built-in modules. So, so can, can someone, uh, might may, maybe Michael can summarize the concerns. I was I wasn't able to join the, the last week meeting. Um, can, can you summarize the the concerns that they raised that Mozilla and and uh, Google um, raised on built-in modules that could be addressed by the compartments? <clears throat> So I'm not sure that the um, concerns that they raised can be addressed by compartments, um, but I will share the concerns that, that were raised. And uh, there have been uh, prior concerns that um, I believe that we had worked through. Um, and, and these concerns were actually um, uh, somewhat, somewhat new to, to us. Uh, and the concerns um, were um, they're the same for both Google and, and for Mozilla. Uh, and the concerns are that um, web developers um, will have no inclination whatsoever to use uh, a module-based approach to access functionality and would continue to use the global object. And, and the web standards organizations um, would not put any new functionality in, into a module. Um, Google said that that was a hard no. Um, they also said that... Um, that um, they were very unlikely to support um, any new functionality in, in TC39 being placed in a module. Um, but th what I thought was curious is they were in support of the built-in module uh, technology itself, the feature itself. And, and, and I was left kind of scratching my head. So you're willing to support a feature that you don't want to use. Um, and I think that part of it is that they were willing that other host environments, non-browser um, host environments could use it, but, um, but then there started being uh, some philosophical discussion that, that um, I thought was important that we don't want to have, we don't want to add new features that um, kind of split, um, you know, what is available on a browser versus what is available on other JavaScript environments. And, um, and it, it, it didn't make sense. I, I, I think in the end, Google saw and, and Mozilla saw that it didn't make sense to add a feature that, that they weren't gonna use and, and we didn't wanna split, split JavaScript. So they, they objected on the grounds that they would not use, they would not support the use of the feature. So that's, that's you know, in a nutshell, I, I think what's, what's going on. I, I think underlying this a little bit is that um, the proposal um, advocated, and, and I think there's fairly strong support uh, on the committee for this, but advocated that any um, feature that's added by TC39 would, would use a dedicated a JS colon prefix, and any other feature that's added by anybody else, whether it be a, a private feature added by a particular organization, company, whatever, 
or a feature that's added by a standard, they are free to use other prefixes, but not the JS colon prefix. And I think that that's an underlying issue that, that, that Google um, was, uh, was against. So uh, Mark or others that were there, uh, Chip, if you have any more comments to add, um, that'd be good. Yeah, I think that reasonable. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Um, I think that uh, uh, them saying that they're willing to support the feature was not was kind of empty. Um, uh, without uh, without there being built-in modules that are available as built-in modules across the JavaScript ecosystem, uh, they understood that they were killing. Um, uh, JavaScript defined built-in modules. Um, uh, you know, hosts are of course free to provide host provided modules uh, in the you know host provided import namespace. That's the case right now. Uh, nothing that happened would change that. So I, I didn't I didn't um, uh, take any words of support as anything other than empty, given the rest of what they were saying. Yeah, and, and I, I took that as the same, um, you know, I made it, there was a lot of offline discussion. We found out the Google and, and Mozilla's willing to, willingness to block about a, oh, three days before the meeting, and there were some offline conversations before that, before the presentation. Um, I, I made it very clear that I didn't view this as a science project. Um, this was intended to be value add to the language. Um, I feel also feel that uh, relevant to bring a solution to built-in modules to the committee again, if we were to, it, uh, among among uh, apart from the the reasons that the issue that the proposal was blocked this time, uh, along the way it became clear that there were some that uh, that that one of the one of the things that were, were we uh, were asked for was a solution that. Uh, that for one, it had to be shimmable, um, and I'm hoping that compartments can answer that. Um, but it also uh, a harder harder issue is that any any functionality that the language provided, uh, uh, they want uh, the parties parties on TC39 wish for those to be available not just to modules but also to program scripts, um, and that. Uh, that, and, and the bulk of Michael's proposal for this round was addressing those concerns. Yeah, and I think compartments, if we start with compartments, we end up actually addressing those concerns in a cleaner manner, cleaner and less powerful. But now that built-in modules are off the table, uh, that less powerful thing becomes our only option, uh, which is that um, the you still have to have the shimming uh, and setup code running in an earlier phase. You have to be running in one compartment in order to create a, um, you know, in order to set up the environment for creating a new compartment in which the, um, the scripts that can directly use built-in modules or the equivalent to built-in modules, it's shimmed modules, are then in the secondary compartment because they can't be in the, the original compartment because it's too late for the original compartment. Uh, and I think that that's a fine answer uh, for JavaScript. What that answer means with regard to scripts embedded in HTML, uh, which was part of what was motivating a lot of the uh, complexity, um, or a lot of the um, uh, is you know still still to be worked out because it's that's that's one where we're, we're crossing standards organizations. But as far as JavaScript itself is concerned, to say that we have to phase it, we have to stage it. And then scripts can only see things as modules that were planted into the module namespace by an early by code in an earlier compartment is where we're going to end up. Cool. I'm still confused, Mark. I'm still confused about if if the consensus is that the committee will continue adding features as a global. Uh, intrinsic or that, that is, 
yeah, we're not, the, the, the dam has burst on that one. We're not going to be able to uh, inhibit uh, um, the rapid expansion of the global namespace, and that makes me very, very sad. Right. So if they're saying that that's the consensus, uh, then what is going to be left for building modules to provide access to what? The, um, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear. Uh, we've mentioned this many times that some kind of, of, of library system besides globals was needed in the language, you know, 15 years ago. So, you know, we were late, late to the game, although we're not the first proposal that tried to do something like this. Um, yeah. I think there is um, the belief um, on the committee by some that, well, we've gone this far and there hasn't been any problems, any showstopper problems. Why do we expect that there'll be problems in the future? Um, and I think that that's um, a little naive, but, but that's an opinion um, and, and different people will come down uh, different ways on whether or not that's a valid concern or not. I think, I think the one inhibition that we should all practice is that um, uh, adding, adding new standard functionality to the global namespace by adding new global names uh, is expensive real estate in the same sense that adding new syntax is expensive real estate. It's less expensive than new syntax still, but it's much more expensive than adding new modules to a built-in module namespace. Uh, and we just need to uh, always raise awareness of that in committee as, um, you know, you don't get to add a new global variable unless it really pays for its weight and, and that we're, we, we all stay, um, you know, we all exercise some, um, some you know, um, some taste with regard to uh, whether the human factors cost of an additional global variable name uh, is worth the functionality that's being added. Uh, and, um, and we don't just let it be a free for all. Right, but uh, my question is more about, let's assume that we have compartments and we have all the infrastructure needed to provide built-ins in compartments. What feature of the language we will provide via these built-ins that will not be provided via a global. And okay. I think what the committee is saying is that there will be none in that bucket because every new feature that we add, we have to add it as global. It could be also as a built-in, but it, it has to be as a global. So I'm still confused about how this ties up to compartments. Okay, so yeah. it's, a, it's a good question. Question. One, one quick answer is that with different hosts providing host provided uh, uh, mod, you know, built in modules, host provided modules in the import namespace, compartments allow um, uh, JavaScript code on one host to emulate the JavaScript environment that would be seen on another host. So the host virtualizability with regard to uh, initially available modules is still, a, is still enabled by compartments. Um, and then once that's entrenched, then, um, you know, once basically, once compartments are something people accept as part of the language going forward, then that also sets us up to revisit this issue of polluting the global, the global scope. If people see that compartments provide a, a more pleasant way to introduce uh, built-in modules. I think that I can, uh, I can say that I see where Caridi's, uh, I think that Caridi's saying is that the requirement that anything that the language provides must be available both to programs and to modules and, uh, and that that is, that that stance is incompatible with the idea of, uh, it, it implies that everything must at least, uh, must be accessible from go globals as a basis. And then, uh, so there's not much of a value add once on once you once you've provided an API for a feature as a global um, that reduces the value add for also um, providing it as a built-in module. And to that, I think 
uh, compartments do not provide uh, do not provide an answer and that if built-in modules are going to make progress uh, as, a, a, as a feature of the language, if, if the language wishes to expose its standard library as built as, as built-in modules, um, that requirement would need to be relaxed. Um, the, uh, the compartments right. can solve that problem. Right, right. That's exactly what, what I was trying to say. Yes. Uh, so I see, I see uh, things that we could do, or I can imagine things that we could do to try to maybe set up the stage for in the future revisiting the built-in modules, like something like, okay, well, this is a global that might or might not be there depending on certain conditions. And uh, you could move it into a built-in rather than have it into a global in certain environments as so on. But that's just hassle for developers because they need to figure out where are they going to get this thing from the built-in or from a global? And what if they don't have a way to get it from the built-in and so on? I, I feel that the compartment is not really providing any anything new that will help the cost of uh, getting built-in modules into the language. I don't think it's, it's going to help in any significant way. Um, obviously, you will be able to emulate that. That's the, that's the reason why we're doing compartment up for built-in, but in general, having the virtualization, so you will be able to emulate this proposal and any other proposal that uh, relies on the module graph, but I don't think it will be adding value to the proposal to try to advance it in the future. Uh, it, 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 pro it provides one fundamental thing, which is uh, it gives us a different and I would say more principled way to handle the shimming problem, which is um, uh, if you're starting on a platform with a earlier set of built-in modules and you're trying to emulate a later set of built-in modules, rather than do it, doing it by modifying some global state, uh, you do it by, um, by creating a new compartment that emulates the new environment and then running the code that should see the new environment under the created compartment. So it, it, it basically provides a staging answer rather than a modifying place answer. Uh, for shimming, uh, and I, and whether that's enough of an improvement to make a difference, I don't know, but it certainly is a difference. I, th I think we need to be cognizant that whether or not we think that we have a better way of providing it, <clears throat> there still may be um, some pushback to, of having modules, uh, built-in modules in the language anyway. So I am not under any kind of illusion that this um, makes the path easier to acceptance. Um, I think part of it is, is a web myopic view of, of JavaScript um, based in history and, and not so much looking to the future and, and, and how we, we hope that people use JavaScript as a language. Yeah, that's, so that's another thing to keep so, in mind, that by the time we revisit this, by the time we're prepared to revisit it, the ecosystem may have changed to where people see the browser as less unilaterally dominant over the rest of the ecosystem and people are see modules as relatively more important and scripts as relatively less important. That all could happen by the time we're set up to revisit this. Yeah, uh, that, that one that Mark, I agree with that. Uh, Mark, I, I believe you've been uh, too optimistic. I, I like that, uh, but I sort to tend uh, to agree with uh, Michael here uh, in some sort of, I would like to give some feedback on uh, what I see on uh, the beauty modules, because I think there is a, a perception that I see here that is slightly different. I kind of agree with all the other reasons like why uh, beauty modules was blocked uh, at this meeting. But I think there's a lot of uh, much more like political concerns over uh, governance for beauty modules. Um, governance was even a word that was used uh, for those blockers and uh, while I think like the sentiment is still like yes people could uh, we could still use uh, TC39 to ship something I, I, and I think even um, we could, could even get more people on board saying uh, we could ship some uh, 
things in, as built-in modules as I do. I'm totally positive about built-in modules as it was proposed. Um, but I, I think the, 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 the problem of people blocking are they're not really much into the concerns of interoperability uh, across platforms. Uh, we have a problem with like the browser's reality they still want the built in modules, but it just work for what you, uh, what works for them, but not in a cross platform sentiment as like things that work in a node or modable or even beyond that. Um, so I think there's much more like a, of a political problem than uh, any technical aspect of built in modules. And I, uh, I feel it's a bit naive to believe compartment will actually get some of those problems solved while we still have these big politics, pol political blockers in game. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, uh, the, but the, the, those political blockers are a matter of, um, I mean, th that's the kind of, of, you know, balance that shifts over time. So, you know, if we, let's say a year from now with, you know, compartments all solid and accepted and entrenched, uh, we then are revisiting all this a year from now, the politics a year from now might be very different than it is today. But I agree with you about the politics today. Yeah. Well, um, no. I'd act, uh, we're a little bit over a time box. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, Leo, I would want I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, progress on realms on the record. Well, in, in my case, it's more uh, just like updates, but not really uh, something uh, like that. I wouldn't mind if we want to extend with beauty modules, to be pretty honest, and I can use next week for realms. Okay, Chris, why don't you uh, go into your presentation? Okay. All right. Uh, so take two. Um, I will try to get through the slides rapidly. Uh, nothing up my sleeve. Uh, present. All right. Uh, recap. Um, talking about. CES proposals uh, and where they are and where we need them to be. Um, at the moment, we have a few sources of truth. There's the specification proposals, which are stale, the excess implementation and the CES shim implementation, which have somewhat diverged um, and, and also are focused on different dimensions of the problem. Um, and I'll talk more about that. And then of course our documentation and then of course our aspirations, which differ from all of those. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a recap of how we've diverged, um, proposals to converge, and some proposals to, uh, to go beyond uh, what is implemented or specified as well. Um, uh, recap, CES, we are reframing the CES proposal as an, uh, we, we have an aspiration to reframe the CES proposal as an umbrella for, um, for uh, security or integrity related um, uh, proposals uh, with our prior successes on the left, our um, aspirations on the right, and how to break them down, like realms, lockdown, harden, um, and then layering compartment so that uh, we, we provide as much value as possible with, uh, with, with motivations and stages instead of um, proposing one big pill. Um, then, uh, just recap, we, uh, we'd previously focused on a realm-centric CES story, uh, which is what our documentation reflects today. Um, and we're moving toward a compartment-centric story where we can uh, have integrity within a realm. Um, and then, um, where we stopped last time uh, was, uh, it discussing the shape of the lockdown API. Um, and uh, so the way the lockdown API is shimmed today is that it introduces the compartment constructor, it introduces the harden, 
function and the harden function is initially inert because we've discovered that harden is not that harden is uh um dangerous and uh, and not useful to use before lockdown um and provides no security guarantees until after lockdown so we've simply forbidden it um until lockdown has been called and then lockdown itself is something that the user may call later at their leisure which repairs the intrinsics including notably also the compartment um which is which is now somewhat orthogonal to lockdown um, in the in the same way that function constructor is orthogonal to lockdown um, and then lockdown erases the intrinsics and then hardens them um, uh, erases the unallowed intrinsics and hardens them last week we discussed moving this around so that the erasure occurs earlier um, during the repair phase so that uh, so that shims um, which we would hope to introduce between repair and lockdown in a future version would have an opportunity would see the progressively growing uh see the environment progressively grow from where they start at the end of repair um and then um augment the whitelist or allow list um uh, according to what they add to the environment which uh provides a potentially better user experience um for shim developers and allows us to detect errors in shims earlier, but does not uh, does not eliminate the need to express the intrinsics and the allow lists as uh, separate globals, which was a concern that Caridity brought up last time two weeks ago that we uh, still have not found a way to not do. Um, I, I have so, a question there. Go ahead, Chip. Um, um, says harden is inert until lockdown will throw an exception if used before lockdown. Um, if it's going to throw an exception, I wouldn't call that inert. Fair. Um, all right. Yeah. Uh, inert is a term that we uh, started using in the implementation for the inert function constructor, which is the, um, the, the constructor of uh, on the shared prototype that throws, if you attempt to use it to, to, uh, to, to, to use it as an evaluator in a place that it can't be. Uh, uh, we can revisit the name. Yeah, inert to me means it does nothing. Yes, as a no, it means no op. Yeah, I get that. Uh, well, well, back to the drawing board on that one. It's fine. We can we can revisit that. Um, the so allowed properties and intrinsics. There were so in the in the so we have an untold story for when we do have support for shimming in the lockdown proposal. Um, how do we express the allow the the allowed properties and the intrinsics and there are some open there's an open design space for it for this at the moment the internal implementation being unconcerned with what uh with the uh, the ergonomics of the api because it does not need to expose them to the user makes certain accommodations uh it uses a, a doubly it uses essentially a json structure for the um uh for the allow uh, for the allow list um, but because it's using a JSON-like structure, it needs to accommodate special names so that it doesn't confuse Dunder Proto for the object's actual Dunder Proto. Um, and we need to be able to, so we use this bracket notation from uh, the current or a previous specification. Mark, correct me if uh, whichever one it is. Um, we're using notation from uh, the current or previous spec uh, in order to disambiguate uh, the object protocol in that. And that is perhaps something that we would not want to expose to users, but it may prove to be practical, um, given that it's very unlikely that the allow list would need to express uh, express names that actually do contain these special characters. Um, and uh, and we could also explore an alternate imperative API, for example, allow allow property uh, like a lockdown dot allow property method to. Um, to, to say that this is something that should be retained after uh, after lockdown. Um, Harden currently fails if the pro, uh, a pro, if the if, if the prototype of a hardened object is not itself hardened, um, which has turned out to be a bit of an ergonomic problem for our Harden. Uh, our, our, when, to be clear, Harden is a function that transitive uh, that guarantees that the object that it's passed is. Uh, is transitively frozen. Uh, that is to say, it's it's uh, all of the properties accessible transitively on the objects, 
uh, of, the, of, of the given object are themselves frozen. And it does that uh, behind the scenes by keeping track of what it has already hardened so that it can short circuit in the cases where it's already seen an object. Um, the current implementation and, uh, and therefore the basis for any proposal that we're about to write um, stops at the prototype. So if it finds that the prototype of an object has not been hardened, um, it just throws an exception. Um, the reason for this being that uh, the, the reason for this being that if we were using harden uh, that harden was invented in the era when we were talking about using realms as an integrity boundary um, as our as our primary uh, story about using it as an integrity boundary um, and harden. Uh, it, it is not desirable for hardened to transit a realm boundary and then uh, uh, into a realm that has not been locked down. Um, and our conclusion at the moment is that that is better served with a distortion on the membrane between the realms um, that would uh, cause the local view of the foreign realm to appear to be hardened um, without necessarily transiting that boundary. Um, and we feel that uh, we can simplify the Harden API uh, from, a user, from the user's perspective by making it so that Harden uh, is simply transitively freezing also up the prototype chain. Um, so that's one proposal that, that we need to codify in the future. Um, so the compartment proposal so, as Chris, go ahead. Before getting into this one, do you uh, happen to have a an example of uh, con constructing a compartment, uh, repairing it, lockdown and harden in the proper order with examples of uh, the kind of allow listing that you have to do and so on. So it would be it would be good to, to get an example to visually see. Yes, uh, we uh, do not be a, maybe having a visual as well yeah. of those uh, those steps. So people can understand what this this thing is doing, because it's yeah. hard by just getting the this text to even for us that are already accustomed to this language, it's just hard to follow on along all the yeah. details. At the moment, we don't even have a prototype for what I'm proposing. Um, it's it's uh, but yes, we should track it an issue, and we should come up with an example shim um, one. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's just, just even if it is pseudocode or something like it, it mm -hmm. tell us like what kind of structures you have to have and what kind of information or data yeah. is needed when calling yeah. those APIs. Yeah, we could yeah. we could come up with a sketch of, for example, taking uh, the, <laughs> the 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 ANSI colors shim, which monkey patches the the string prototype, and while uh, while we certainly wouldn't advise. Uh, a frivolous use of of of, <laughs> of the colors package as a shim. It does make a um, a concise example of what wouldn't be necessary. That's a really nice example. I like that. Yeah. Um, a a a more substantive thing that's a, that's much worse as an example, as an expository example, uh, is um, uh, but it's something that I'm involved in right now is uh, shimming the error stack proposal. Uh, which right now is not being done as a shim, it's being done as a built-in repair because we don't have the, the full shimming support in place yet. But I would like to move much of that into uh, being a shim rather than being built into a uh, lockdown. As yeah. the, motiv the motivation for this topic uh, of, of shimming on lockdown is actually very much that we have already discovered as I'm about to present about the compartment, opportunities to layer shims within the lockdown um, and, and then eject them from the CES shim entirely so that we can create, uh, um, uh, so, so that users can pay as they go and understand them in, in separate layers, uh, which also has very nice properties for understanding these layers from a security perspective. Because for example, um, compartments uh, have, have many facets right, uh, from, and many use cases. And uh, the simplest and earliest proposals for the compartment API um, are, are just compartments as evaluators. And that provides uh, a solid security foundation for building all of the subsequent layers, such that the layers below it uh, 
uh, are, are not responsible for ensuring those guarantees anymore. Um, so the many facets of, of, of compartment, uh, it, it, the base layer of the compartment proposal that most of us are most familiar with is just an object that has an evaluate method that can evaluate source inside of a container. And this is the, this is the sufficient value, uh, foundation for being able to evaluate pro programs inside of a container um, after lockdown. Um, and the end that that layer gives us the ability to provide um, to endow those compartments with limited uh, additional globals above those that are just granted uh, uh, as as the intrinsics that provided by the language. Um, and then there's a layer atop that, which is the uh, which I'd like which colloquially is the excess layer, uh, which is a compartment as a vessel for compiled modules. Uh, and in this world, the excess world, the only the only modules that you get in an application are those that were compiled into the into the binary. Um, they serve in a similar way, they in a similar capacity to the built-in modules that we've discussed before. Um, and in this world, the use of the compartment constructor is to uh, to uh, successively attenuate compartments. So you would be able to say, I I have I have in my compartments module identifier namespace all of the built-in modules that uh, that there uh, all of the modules that there are or ever will be in my application and then um, uh, create a compartment within a compartment that receives a limited subset of those compartments by name and uh, the compartment has the ability to execute those modules synchronously because the, they do not there is in this world the compartment constructor is not a loader all modules that will ever, ever exist have already been loaded and can be immediately synchronously executed. Um, the compartment shim does not have that capacity yet. Um, and, uh, and it is our intention to implement it so that it provides a, an equivalent ecosystem to XS. Uh, but we have been focusing on the compartment as a module loader um, and asynchronous module loader. And at that layer, um, it introduces the need to provide uh, module specifier resolution and load and module loading as hooks. Um, and at that layer, it is sensible for there to be a load method um, that, uh, that, that, that uses these two hooks in order to build out a module graph that uh, the prior layer would be able to proceed from. Um, so once you have loaded the transitive modules of a, of, of a module graph, you can then use import now um, in order to execute them. And you would be able to use the same access style usage of compartment to um, provide limited access to, to modules, to sub compartments. And it isn't just about limitation as well. Um, it's possible in access to have um, uh, all of uh, the module text for every module in your in your root compartment, but not be able to link them because their uh, relative module identifiers do not make sense in that compartment, and you need to um, alias them into a child compartment in order for them to be mutually linkable, which is a detail we can discuss in the future. Um, and then, a, go ahead. Uh, one thing that confuses me on the slide is. Uh, twice you have just a simple dot as a specifier, and I don't know what you're trying to uh, to con to convey by using a, just a dot as a specifier. Ah, I see. Um, it, that is a convention in uh, the, the the dot is an alias for the main module in the Node.js packaging ah. convention. Um, I've only used that here in order to avoid having to have a more a longer name. <laughs> um, it's, 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 go ahead. So I, I I suspect that import now is only useful. You have a load. Is that true? Uh, in excess, no. Uh, in excess, you the import now comes at a at a lower layer because it does and it does not have a load method because all of the modules in excess are pre-compiled into your binary. Um, for anything on the web or anything in node, um, import now would not be useful without load. And I will discuss more as we go down. I have a proposal that import now itself is not particularly useful on the specification and I'll explain why later. Um, but as a mental model, um, 
the, the having the, the, there is a notion that after after the, the transitive dependencies of module have been loaded, um, it is then possible to execute them without any further loading, and that is an idea that's captured very well by the name import now, um, regardless of whether it continues to be useful in practice. Yeah, uh, uh, my only suggestion here is, is change the load to preload. Um, since that's the, the term that we use in, in browsers and maybe even in node, right? Preload seems to be a little bit more easy to digest. Preload is more specific than this is intended to be. Um, lo preloading is a case of loading, but uh, let, uh, in, in the interest of time, um, uh, we are going to revisit every, uh, every one of these slides at some point in the future, and let, let's dig into that then. And, um, the, so, uh, the, but, but as, as you're both, as, you have, as you've pointed out, I'm building up to the actual use case, which is, uh, which is dynamic import based off of compartment, which is built on top of load and import now. Um, or preload and import now. And uh, go ahead. So Chris, I, I, I'm sorry. I just want to add something. I, I might have missed this. Um, I'm sorry if, if that's the case. But but for import now in load, whatever, regardless uh, the name, uh, it seems like they're both um, more useful as like serialized uh, methods rather than just like uh, one importing and one loading. Um, it's serialized methods as in you would uh, serialize multiples, but maybe this is already in game here. Uh, Multiple modules at, at once. Oh, I see. Yes. Um, the uh, in practice, there's usually a single entry point for an application. Um, it is certainly possible. To do multi, uh, to, to for example, promise all on uh, a, a series of loads, um, and then uh, and then and then opportunistically import them. Um, the that is not that that you uh, you have not missed anything. I have not proposed such an API um, for for loading multiple things. It is it is conceivable that load could be very attic. Uh, yeah. It's definitely uh, not something like to uh, take action right now, but at least something to be considered at, at some yeah. point. Yeah, load can be very attic. Import now and import cannot um, uh, because of the signature. Load returns a promise for undefined um, and it, it would compose well. Uh, yeah, okay, so, um, so the plan for the shim is uh, for us to stratify it so that there's a very, very small uh, lockdown layer that contains harden. Um, pardon, that the CES shim itself subsumes just repair and lockdown. Harden can be a separate shim or, or, or consolidated. That's, that's immaterial. Um, but the compartment shim is orthogonal because it's useful even without lockdown. And lockdown's relationship to the compartment is very similar to its relationship with the function constructor. So we could conceivably layer these separately. Um, and that may make the compartment shim more palatable to TC39 because it is effectively the missing module loader API. Um, and, uh, and it does not need to be loaded into the CES gun <laughs> or be associated with, with CES directly in order for it to make progress. And it making progress is helpful to CES. Um, and then, uh, and then the set, and then the but the compartment shim with the evaluate layer um, is also separate, separable from the module layer. Um, and the module layer has two facets to it itself. One part of it, which is uh, sufficient for uh, for third party modules like Common JS, JSON, and WASM. Um, but is not sufficient for ECMAScript modules because, um, at least for the perspective of the shim, it's desirable for the user to pay as they go, um, the pay for what they need, and uh, and being able to do ESM on the shim requires and training a full parser like Babel, um, which means that the uh, that all of the layers above ESM weigh about 35 kilobytes minified. And 
if you include ESM support, the, the, the size of the shim blows up to about three megabytes. Um, and in order to make it practical for us to use the shim, uh, it is probably possible for us to layer this in a way that, uh, that the minimal evaluator runtime is sufficient for uh, as, as a compile target for ESM so that uh, a bundled application would not need to, uh, to contain that parser. Um, so th this, this is the direction we're kind of going with the shim for implementation related reasons and also somewhat in order to frame it in a way that makes it more, uh, more palatable to, to, uh, to the committee. Um, so uh, something that we need to do for the shim is uh, convert the support for static modules into itself a layer of shim, which we can only do after we add shimming support to lockdown. Um, and the idea would be to use uh, would be to use the the version of Cess that does not have the compiler as uh, as as a bootstrap. Um, so here, uh, thus begins the uh, the succession where I propose changes to the shim and very and shim and proposals uh, for TC thirty nine. Um, the first one is one that we've already implemented in Cess Shim, and that is the addition of a name uh, to the options bag for the compartment constructor. Uh, compartments are similar in spirit to uh, functions in this way. Uh, the name is useful in the implementation for surfacing the name of the compartment as uh, loader errors uh, transit up. Uh, so you can say that I failed to load module B because I failed to load, or I failed to load module A because I failed to load module B from this compartment B and et cetera, et cetera, uh, and provide informative errors. Uh, I don't expect that this is controversial. <laughs> um, the, um, and then support loading without executing. So the, uh, as I mentioned in the layering, that there's this load or possibly preload method on the compartment that is uh, is potentially useful even if you do not intend to eventually import, because this can be used in tools in order to build out the module graph for an application, um, for either the static analysis of that graph or in our particular application's purpose um, to build an archive of a full application that can be then trans then shuffled off somewhere else. Um, this is sort of spiritually similar to um, to using browserify or webpack um, and uh, and having a load method on the compartment API and a module method in order to um, in order to express linkage between uh, compartments at the at the same layer um, uh, makes it possible to write that kind of application so the the use case I have in mind is the compartment match mapper which is um, an application in our CES shim monorepo um, that uses CES in order to emulate Node's style of packaging um, such that every package receives its, has its own compartment. This itself is a foundation layer for uh, 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 refactoring a tool like LavaMote from MetaMask, which does this in order to, uh, in order to bring ESM support onto, on, uh, into LavaMote. Um, and, uh, and what LavaMote does is it attenuates the authority of every compartment based off of uh, static analysis, uh, and, and policy generation, um, such that third par party packages do not necessarily have access to all of the built-in modules or, uh, and, and only have access to the dependencies that they've exp explicitly declared in their package JSON. Um, which I think is also a big win for developer experience uh, because it is currently possible to have a working application while still forgetting to express in your package, Jason, what your, uh, what people who are depending on your package will need to have installed by NPM or Yarn, et cetera. Um, and this is the way the compartment mapper works when it's using load modules. Uh, uh, the APIs are on the top. We have an import location method, a load location, write archive, make archive parse and load and import on archives. Um, and the way it works is that in the base, in the simple case, if you're just importing, uh, if you're importing an application off of the file system, time check, I have five minutes for me. Uh, 
you you would go down this leftmost workflow where you would search for the uh, uh, you'd search for the package JSON that contains the module you're trying to import, build a graph of all of its compartments by searching for node modules in the in parent directories from whatever module uh, from whatever package you're you're in, and then uh, assemble that into a graph of compartments, actually constructing those compartments and linking them to each other, and then calling load, and then calling import. Uh, and that's that's the workflow for essentially implementing the equivalent of node and that module name. Um, load location does everything of, of, of that except not executing. Um, then write archive uh, does all of the same things except that instead of executing, it's passing its own import hooks that allow it to record and observe what was loaded in order for it to satisfy the constraints of your entry module. And then it writes those, uh, it writes whatever it loaded into a zip file. Um, so resuming on the other side, you can skip those first two steps. If you start with a zip file and just parse it, read the, the compartment map out of a JSON file in that archive, and then reconstruct and assemble your compartment graph from that directly instead of inferring it from the shape of the file system, then load, then execute, et cetera. Um, So I'm proposing that we add module and load methods to the compartment API. And this is a sample of how to use that. Um, and in this case, we have two compartments. There's one compartment that is a dependency of another compartment. We create the parent compartment in this way, um, passing the dependency as a module into the module map uh, of the parent compartment, and then giving it an import hook so that it can uh, load so that it can load modules off of the file system in whatever location. Uh, in the package location for that compartment, and then you call load, and then you could call import. Um, I'm also proposing that we rename import hook to load hook because I think that having the load method makes it clear that the import hook is not subservient to importing; it is it is subservient to loading, um, and uh, and that you uh, when you're loading, it is going to be driving calls to the import hook without actually importing. And I think that this name would make that relationship more clear. Um, I'm also proposing uh, that we add, so we already have the idea of a static module record. I'm proposing that we create a constructor for this um, that takes a source and location. This doesn't exist in the proposal yet, but is an obvious need for ESM. Um, I'm also proposing that uh, we introduce the ability to link against non-ESM modules by, in addition to just having static module records, also having a static module interface. Uh, and this is just an object that, in, uh, an, uh, this, is, this is an object shaped as to describe its imports and exports and then provides an execute method. The execute method would receive the proxy to exports, the origin compartment, and the res resolution of its imports. Um, uh, I, there's a typo there. Resolution of its imports, um, given the imp, uh, given the resolve hook is uh, given uh, in the compartment in which it's being executed. This allows us to do common JS, JSON, and WASM in addition to ESM. Uh, noteworthy about this is that it is not able to model. Uh, my time's up. I'm going to pause here and revisit next time we have a chance. Does that sound good? Yeah, I think your uh, presentation suffered from rushing a bit there. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, the idea is to cover the material and then revisit. Uh, uh, so we can break this down into topics. Uh, and I'm a apolo uh, apology for the rush. How much, uh, how much remains on this first pass? Uh, how did we do? We got to, as soon as I find my window. Oh yeah, it's still up full presentation mode tab. Uh, we got to slide 21 of 32. Okay, so let's let's continue this first pass next time. Sounds good. Um, I will stop recording. <laughs>